nice to be here, and it's nice to see you. I wondered when it was coming, would there be anybody here tonight? But you have made it along, and uh, we appreciate your presence very much, and we just pray that the Lord would bless as we look at the scriptures tonight. Now, we're going to do something different tonight. We're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the little book of Haggai. H-A-G-G-A-I, Haggai. If you find Zephaniah and find Zechariah, you'll find it in between the two. Little book of Haggai, chapter 1. Found it? Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shephtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedach, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, <clears throat> the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. <clears throat> ye eat, and ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages, to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Well, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stead from dew, and the earth is stead from her fruit. I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil. And upon, that, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labour of the hands. <clears throat> then Zerubbabel the son of Shephtiel, and Joshua the son of Josedach the high priest, and all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, the word of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shethiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jostach, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Now the Lord give us good understanding of his word and keep your Bible open at that because we'll be looking at some of the other verses <coughs> as we come into chapter 2 tonight and we'll finish at 10 to 9. Okay, even we're not finished. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight but we'll finish at 10 to <coughs> and then that'll not be too long. We'll have a cup of tea. <coughs> there were two disciples on the road one day to, or one evening it was actually, on the road to a little village called Emmaus. They had left Jerusalem. They had been up there for the feast of Passover. They had probably stayed with their relatives up there for a couple of days. The man's name was Cleophas and the woman's name was Mary. And they're heading home and they're going to their little house down in the village of Emmaus. A lovely little village. I have been in it and David and Gillian and many times we have been there. Lovely little village, the village of Emmaus, about six miles from the uh, city of Jerusalem. And they're heading home. And they're talking about the events that have happened in recent days. And they're sad. And, and a stranger draws near. And he walks with them. And maybe because he had came behind them or whatever, I don't know. But their eyes were holding and they didn't know him. Because it was the Lord Jesus himself. And so he said to them, what manner of communications are you that you, yet you walk and you're sad? Obviously, they, they were sad, and he said, you're sad today. Why? What's the reason? And they said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things that have happened in these last days? And he said, what days? 
and they said about Jesus of Nazareth, and we had hopes that he was our Messiah, and so on. And then he said to them, O oh, slow of heart, foolish one, slow of heart to believe. And then it says this, beginning at Moses and to all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now notice please, beginning at Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, this little prophet here, oh I'm sure, I'm sure that he mentioned Haggai the prophet. You see, these prophetic Scriptures are important. Sometimes we call them uh, small prophets and big prophets, major prophets and minor prophets. Why do, we, why do we say that? It doesn't mean that these prophecies are less important than the big prophecies. The major prophecies are big long books. For example, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. Indeed, Isaiah has 66 chapters, whereas this little book of Haggai has only two chapters. It's the only book in your English Bible, by the way, that has only two chapters. That has only 38 verses in it. The only book that's smaller than it is the little book of Obadiah. And Obadiah has only 21 verses. But these are, these are minor prophets. But just because they're called minor prophets, it doesn't mean they're less important. They are minor prophets with major messages. Minor prophets with major messages. And so is it this little book of Haggai. Haggai is a minor prophet, but he has a major message. His message is from the Lord. Notice chapter 1, verse 1. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai. Notice chapter 2, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai. Notice chapter 2, verse 20. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai. So these books are important because... They are coming from the Lord. That was the function of a prophet. The Lord gave to these men, to Haggai, to Zechariah, Zephaniah, to Isaiah. God gave these, these men the prophetic message. And then they relayed that message to the people. So they were prophetic in that sense. So this little prophecy of Haggai is very, very important. And all the prophecies, all these minor prophets, I hope you don't forget about them, by the way, because they're important. And you should read them and you should study them. Because if you go to heaven someday and you meet Haggai and he says to you, how did you find the little book that I wrote? And you say, well, sorry Haggai, you know, it didn't just, it'll be very embarrassing for you. So at least you'll be able to say that we've read it tonight and you've looked at it and studied it in a little way. Now just to give a little bit of the background of Haggai as we get into it because we want to get into the practical implications of the book tonight. But the political uh, fulfillment of the book and the political aspect of the book is very interesting and very important. Remember that the kings, the days of the kings, the, the kingdom of Israel re really came to its zenith in Solomon's time. You remember the nation, they came to uh, Samuel the prophet and they said to Samuel, now Samuel, you're old and your sons don't walk after your ways. We would, we would like you to make, a, make us a king. We, we want to be like all the other nations. Now God never intended his people, Israel, to be like all the other nations. And God doesn't intend believers to be like the world, by the way. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. Anyhow, Samuel was displeased. And God said, look, Samuel, don't, don't, don't you be angry. Don't you be, be displeased because they, they, they haven't forsaken you, they've forsaken me. And so God gave them a king, of course, Saul, and he didn't do very well. Sure he didn't. But really, the monarchy came to its zenith in Solomon's day. And after Solomon's day, well, it waned because Solomon had a son and his name was Rehoboam. And he wasn't wise like his dad was. He wasn't a very wise young man. And he took foolish counsel. And because of his foolish counsel, there was a division in the kingdom. And there was another man called Jehoshaphat, uh, sorry, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was away in Egypt. He had been in exile there when Solomon was king. Uh, because, well, Solomon sought his life and he fled away to Egypt. But he came back again. And he was a mighty man of valor. And... Ten of those tribes followed him, and they went north, 
And they set up their kingdom in Samaria and made Samaria their, their capital city or their capital town. And of course, that's where idolatry began, up there in the north. And the tribe of Dan set up the, set up the, the golden images and, and the idols. And that's where it started, away up there in the northern kingdom. Two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin, followed Rehoboam and went south and made their kingdom in their capital city in Jerusalem. Of course, in, in, in 580, 586, the Assyrians came and, and they took the remnants of the northern kingdoms away down to Assyria. And then in 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar with the armies of Babylon came and took the remnants of Judah and Benjamin away down into Babylon. And they were there for 70 years. For 70 years. But you know, during those years, after the Babylonian kingdom uh, collapsed, the uh, Medo-Persian empire came into existence in 539 in Daniel's, remember in Daniel chapter 5, in Daniel's feast, the Medo-Persians came and they overthrew the Babylonian kingdom and Darius reigned uh, in the kingdom, Daniel chapter 5. And the Medes and Persians, Darius was good to the, the uh, Jewish people, and under Zerubbabel, as we'll see in a minute or two, and Joshua that we've read about tonight, a remnant came back and began to build the, uh, the city of Jerusalem again. If you turn in your Bible back a wee bit just to the book of Ezra there, if you, you'll find it coming in after Second Chronicles, little book of Ezra <coughs> and chapter 1, First and Second Chronicles and then Ezra and then Nehemiah. And you read there in verse 1 of the little book of Ezra in chapter 1, in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Uh, this is the word of Cyrus, king of Persia. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. That was a remarkable thing wasn't it? And so he said in verse 3, who is, who is he among you and among all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord of Israel. So he was, he was giving a decree, if any of these Jewish people that were now in captivity in Babylon, if any of them wanted to go back to Jerusalem to build the house, then he would... Uh, 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 he would set this decree, utter this decree, and give them letters to go to do that. And 50,000 of them took up the offer and went back up to the city of Jerusalem. Turn over the page there <clears throat> to chapter 3. They set up the altar upon its basis, chapter 3, verse 3, and, and, and they offered sacrifices to God. And then look down at verse 10. The builders laid the foundation of the temple. So this is the start of things. The builders laid the foundations of the temple, and so on. And they sang together in verse 11. Uh, look at verse 3 of chapter 4. Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. We ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, had commanded us. But then you see there was opposition. When you get a work for God, you'll always get those who oppose it. And of course, the Samaritans here, you remember in chapter 4 of John, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Remember that? This is where it originated. And they were opposed to the building of the city and, and all that was happening there. And you read in chapter 4 and verse 24, Then the work of the house of God ceased which is Jerusalem. It ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And that's where the little prophecy of Haggai comes in. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of the history of it. Now, the prophecy of Haggai is important for another reason. It's significant prophecy because of the period of time that it covers. You see, if you read and go into the dates, but we haven't time to go into all the dates tonight, and go into all the dates, you'll find that this prophecy was uttered the very year that the 70-year desolation period ended. The very year. The 70 years had been fulfilled. 
Jeremiah and his prophecy had prophesied the 70 years of captivity, and now they're fulfilled in the very year that Haggai uttered his prophecy. So Haggai is a post-exile prophet. That is, he comes in after the exile. There are many prophets who write there in pre-exile period, but Haggai was a post uh, a post exile prophet. Uh, he was a post exile prophet along with uh, Zechariah and Malachi. Those were the three prophets that prophesied after the seventy year captivity. So it's, it's important because of that. So his his is his is the first prophecy after the people have come back from seventy years exile or 70 years captivity. So the shadow of the 70 years is slipping away and a new dawn is, 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 is drawing near and, and dawning and, and um, Jehovah is making this announcement. He's making this prophetic announcement and he's making it through Haggai the prophet. So that, that's sort of a little bit of the history of the, of the book. Now, Please note that there are two other men that are mentioned in the book. Did you notice that? There's this man called Zerubbabel. Look at chapter 1 again where we read in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheftil, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people obeyed. So these are two men that were under Haggai. Uh, Zerubbabel seemed to be the political representative of the tribe of Judah and um, Joshua seemed to be the spiritual head of the tribe of Judah. Now there were two good men and there were two interesting men because we're not told much about Joshua really. You read about him again in Zechariah chapter 8. He was a high priest but he seems that he was a good man and um, we'll look at him a little bit when we come to see him, not much known about him. But this man, Zerubbabel, we know quite a wee bit about him. He was the man who led the um, 50,000 that come back that we read about in Ezra's time. Indeed, Joshua was there too. These were the two men that spearheaded the work. It had lay latent and dormant for about 14 or 15 years now. We'll talk about that in a wee moment or two. But this man, Zerubbabel, well... He hadn't a very good start in life because he was the son of Sheth Teal. Now, Sheth Teal seems to have been a good man. But Sheth Teal's father was a man called Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim wasn't a good king. In fact, Israel had no good kings. None. The northern tribes they had no good kings at all. And remember, they were headed up by Ahab and Jezebel. You remember them. Now, the southern kingdom had some good kings. Josiah and Joash and um, good king Hezekiah and Uzziah those were good kings but this man hadn't a good start because he hadn't a good father sorry he hadn't a good grandfather and he hadn't a good great grandfather but you know the grace of God is a wonderful thing and the grace of God brings him into the royal line and when you go home we haven't time to look at all the scriptures when you go home if you read in Matthew's gospel chapter 1 and verse 12, you'll read this, that after they were brought to Babylon, Jehoias begot uh, Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel got Abihu. That's in verse 13 of chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel. So, so he's brought into the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? It shows you what the grace of God can do in men's lives. So these were two good men. There were men who could be relied on. There were men whose word was their bond. There were men who were always there. There were men, we were talking tonight about men with stickability. Well, these were men with stickability. These were men who were there when you needed them. You need men like that on your assemblies and in your fellowships and in your churches. Men, men who can be relied on. Men whose word is their bond. Men who are always there. And women too. You know on the Lord's day he was very dependent in many ways on the ladies, on the women. And you read about them in Luke's Gospel chapter 8. We haven't time to turn to it or look at it tonight. But you know these were men who ministered to the Lord of his substance. And his disciples. Remember there were 13 of them, 12 men and the Lord. Could be better looking after 13 men, isn't there? Maybe some of you ladies, when you look after one man, you think, you think it's plenty. But, yeah. but you know, 
they, they, these were ladies whom the Lord... And, and remember, remember at the cross, they stood by the cross of Jesus, Peter and James. Oh, no. No, they were away in the background. They stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene, faithful women who stood at the cross. So we need men that are faithful, and we need women that are faithful true. Uh, to. Now there are four great messages in the book. Four great messages. His prophecy, by the way, lasted somewhere about four months. Somewhere in around four months. But how important are the prophecies of Haggai? So we're going to look at them. The first message appeals to the hands of the people. Look at chapter 1, verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time to build the Lord's house. Verse 8, go up to the mountains, bring wood, build the house. So the first message appeals to the hands of the people. It's time to build. Time to build. The second message appeals to the hearts of the people. Chapter 2, verse 3, because into the work it began, things began to wane a wee bit. And uh, uh, the building began to just settled down a wee bit and things began to settle down a wee bit and they needed a wee bit of a spurt. So the second message appeals to the heart of the people. Chapter 2, verse 3. Who is left among you that saw the house in her first glory? And then verse 4. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, saith the Lord of works. I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. So the second message appeals to the hearts of the people. The third message appeals to the holiness of the people. Verse 11 of chapter 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, Because there must be holiness of character, and we'll see when we come to that, of course, that God's work and, and uh, uh, the things that we do for God, we need to be clean vessels, and it's only clean vessels that are fit for the Master's use. And then the fourth message, if we get to it tonight, and if we have time, appeals to the hope of the people and looks out into the future glory. So there are these four great messages that the little book of Haggai uh, circles around, and we're going to look at them now and maybe try and draw some of the uh, spiritual lessons uh, from them. So, the first message then that Haggai brings, well, the first message, it really appeals to the hands of the people. Now look at these people. Look at chapter 1 and verse 2. Speak, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, now this is what the people were saying. This is what they were saying. What were they saying? The time has not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. This is not the time. This is not, you see, there was, a, there was excuses. They were making excuses. There was an apathy among the people, a dryness, wasn't there? You know, it's about 12 years or maybe 13 years when anything was done. And the, the debris was all around. If you, if you have ever seen a building site or been on a building site, and then it lies dormant or it lies vacant for about 12 or 13 years, you know, gets into a bit of a mess, into a bit of a state. And these people were looking at it and they were saying, look at the mess. Twelve years have come and gone, you know. Just, just let it sit. We'll not bother. This is not the time to build the Lord's house. Excuses, a dryness, an apathy among the people. What's the big problem amongst the people of God today? Well, just the same. Apathy invades the church. And there's a, there's a, there's a let us ness if there's such a word. A, look, a lukewarmness, isn't there? And the people bring excuses. And there's an apathy and a dryness. The Lord's day becomes the Lord's half day. And you get SMOs. We have them Sunday morning only. And they forget about the gospel meeting. And the prayer meeting. And the study of the word. What's God's word to them? Look at verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God says to us tonight, I want you to take stock. Consider your ways. Look, look, look at the building. It's time to build, verse 4. 
It's time for you, O oh you that dwell in your sealed. Now there's an important wee thing here. You that dwell in your sealed houses, your panelled houses. Now there was no such a thing in Israel as panelled houses. Panelled houses were for kings. Would it be verily possible that they were using the very timber that had been provided for the building of the temple to build their own houses? Would that be possible? It seems by the reading of it that that is the very case. It is time for you, verse 4, O ye to dwell in your sealed houses, your panelled houses, and this house lie waste. Now look at verse 2, the Lord's house. Look at verse 4, this house. Look at verse 8, the house. Look at verse 9, my house. You see, they were concerned with their own house and the things. And it's not wrong, of course, to be... to. To, to, to furnish your own house and look after your own house and look after your own things. And God expects you to do that. And if God has given you a home and he has given you a family, he expects you to look after it. Of course he does. And we shouldn't be careless with the things that God has given to us. We should be thankful for what God has given to us. But here they, they were doing it at the expense of the Lord's house. They were concentrating on their own selves, on their own buildings, on their own furnishings, on their own ways. And they had forgot about the Lord's house. The Lord's things. Tell me now, has the Lord priority in my life? Has the Lord priority in your life? Look at verse 6. You have shown much and bring in little. You eat, but you haven't enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none of you warm. You earn wages to put into a bag with holes. What's God saying? God's saying, you stop building, I stop blessing. You stop building, I stop blessing. You know, the secret of spiritual and temporal prosperity is putting God first in your life. The secret of spiritual and temporal prosperity is putting God first in your life. There's a great cardinal principle that follows through your Bible. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. God says this, God says, Those that honor me, I will honor those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You honor God in your life, and he'll honor you. Now, I wonder how you're getting on at the building. Hmm? I wonder how I'm getting on at the building. Because we're building in, and let me say this tonight, and I was thinking about this this afternoon and this morning when I was sitting reading again. You know, the time to build is getting shorter. We live in the last of the last days. Look around you tonight. Have you ever... I'm 55 years in the assembly. 55 years in the assembly. And I have never seen days like this before. These days are unprecedented. These are days when, when men's hearts are failing them for fear. And these things that are coming to pass. The Lord Jesus said, when these things begin... When you see these things beginning to take place, to come to pass, look up for your redemption draws near. And then he said, This generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. What generation? This generation. Now. And a generation in your Bible is 40 years. And I reckon we are over 20 into it now. I'm not predicting the Lord's coming or saying, or saying he's going to come in 20 years. I think he'll be here long before that. I believe that, I believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. I believe that he could come at any moment. I'm sure of that. These things that we are seeing today are preludes to the tribulation period, to the seal judgments of Revelation chapter 6. And we are seeing them, we are seeing them coming to pass now. And this generation shall not be full, shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Brethren and sisters, the time's getting short. If you're going to build for God, build now. And build it in. You remember 
in John chapter 4, they, they were looking over the fields and, and they were saying the fields, they, they're white to harvest. It's going to be four months to the harvest. And the Lord said, look at the fields now. They're white to harvest. We need to do it now. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I'd given him more, but it'll be too late then. If we have anything for God, doing anything for God, then we need to do it now. So don't forget the labor of our hands. And, and remember the great biblical principle to put the Lord first in our lives. Now there's so many things, but I'm trying to skip over and do what we can. So this, this first minute, now, now what was the response? What was the response of the people? Well, notice please, we read it tonight. Notice, look down at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shephtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jostak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Now that's a tremendous verse. That is a tremendous verse. Look at it again. How did the people respond? They responded promptly. There was an immediate response in less than a month. In fact, I can tell you that within 23 days, you look at the dates, look, look them out for yourself. Within 23 days, they were at it. And these men were the leaders. Look at it again. Zerubbabel, the son of Jethiel, Joshua, the son of Jostech, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. It's a good idea. Obedience is better than sacrifice. The Lord wants us to obey. And they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Now notice the verbs. Notice they worked. They obeyed. They feared. They were at the work. And these leaders, that's what I'm saying. These, these, were, these were men, these were men who, who could be relied on. Men, men who were always there. Men with stickability. Men who led by example. The leadership, Zerubbabel, Joshua. And it filtered down into the camp. You know, there's always the promise. If we work for God, he works for us. Isn't 13 a tremendous verse? Then speak Haggai, the Lord's messenger, with the Lord's message. Not a tremendous thing. You see, you could be the Lord's messenger and not of the Lord's message. <laughs> but if you're the Lord's message, you're always the Lord's messenger. You got it. You could be the Lord's messenger and not have the Lord's message. I could be here as the Lord's messenger, but I mightn't have the Lord's message. But if I have the Lord's message, I'm always the Lord's messenger. And I believe sincerely that this is a message for the wee meeting tonight. I wouldn't have brought it to you if I didn't think it was, and have spent a good bit of time on it. And so Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message, he says unto the people, I am with you, saith the Lord. Not lovely. I am with you, saith the Lord. Let me say this to you tonight, brethren and sisters. If we work for God, he works for us. If we work for God, he works for us. That's always his promise. We work for him, he works for us. In the house where David and I stay when we go to, to Romania, Marine and Edda's house, I have a little photograph on, on my phone and there's a picture in the room that, where we sit, the sitting room it would be, and it says this on it, He died for me, I live for him. He died for me, I live for him. I am with you, saith the Lord. Not lovely? Brethren and sisters, be encouraged tonight. Look at verse 4 of chapter 2. Now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all ye the people of the land, saith the Lord. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Not lovely? Brethren and sisters, if we work for God, he works for us. I am with you, saith the Lord. Be strong. 
You sisters that teach Sunday school class, or EBR, or EGR, you, you be strong when you're teaching these young ones and bringing the Word of God to them and being faithful to them. Because every Sunday or every Tuesday night or Wednesday night or whatever night, night it is, you have to come when you're faithful. And this is what God's word, <coughs> word to you tonight. Be strong. Why? Because God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. Be strong, you who preach the gospel. Be strong, you who give out tracts. Be strong, you who visit the sick people in their homes. Be strong, all you that write little letters to missionary folks, maybe, or to those who are sick and not well. Be strong. Why? Because the Lord says, I'm with you. The response of the people. They obeyed. They feared. Oh, maybe today we need to be stirred up just like these people. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need the Lord to come and give us a bit of a shake and shake us up. Oftentimes you hear people say today, these are the days of last things, you know. These are the latest saying, this is the latest saying period of church history. And these are the days of small things. And we'll just sit back and we'll just relax because the Lord's coming soon. This is not the day of small things. This is the day of big things. The message that we have for people who are still in their sins is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. What greater thing could you have than that? The very dynamite of God. These are the days of big things. Let's be stirred up. Let's be like these people here. Let's obey and fear and work and put our backs into it. And, and, and heed to this exhortation. Why? Because the Lord says, I'm with you. God says, oh, you work for me. Then I'll work. Then I'll work for you. And you know something? In four years, the whole thing was completed. The whole big temple was completed. The response of the people. They have only five minutes. Look, chapter 2, when we come to chapter 2, <coughs> the second message really to the people, <coughs> he appeals to the heart of the people. You see, things began to wane a wee bit when they come into the building a wee bit. And morale started to come down a wee bit. And, 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 and some, of the, some of the company were looking back and they were saying, oh, you know, we remember the good old days. We remember the good old days. And we remember the glory of Solomon's temple, the former temple. And we remember all of those things. Well, you know, sometimes you hear that too. Now, we can learn from the past, but we don't need to live in the past. We can learn from the past, but we don't need to live in the past. We need to press forward and press on. In our, in our Bible reading at the minute, down in Ardmore, well, we were looking, we'll, we'll not have it now for a week or two, <coughs> we were looking at the book of Philippians. And the, Phil the book of Philippians in the New Testament, Paul's pressing toward the mark. He's looking forward. He, he's like the athlete. He's pressing toward the mark. For the praise of the high calling. I was telling them the other night. <coughs> in 1955. Some of you wouldn't remember that. Some of you remember the door. In 1955. Roger Bannister. <coughs> was the first man to run the four minute mile. He run the mile in under four minutes. That same year. There was a French man called John Lenny. And he ran the four minute mile as well. And the big thing was to get these two men. Head to head you see. And later that year, they got the two men head to head, Bannister and Lanny. And they got them in the race, and the starter's pistol went. And soon the rest of the field was left behind. And Lanny and Bannister were away out in front. Lanny was just ahead. Lanny was just ahead. Bannister, he didn't know where Bannister was, but that Bannister was right at his shoulder, you know. He was right there at his shoulder. And he was afraid to look around. And they came into the, into the last straight, into the home straight, <clears throat> and the tape was ahead of them. And Lanny could stick it no longer. And he glanced round. And the moment he glanced round, Bannister just went past him and breasted the tape. And Lanny said later on, he said, the look back cost me the race. The look back cost me the race. Brethren and sisters, we don't look back. We learn from the past, but we don't live in the past. We press on. We press on toward the mark for the praise of the high calling of God in Christ.
When we come to verses 10 to 12 of chapter 2, well, <coughs> he appeals now to the holiness of the people. He appeals to the holiness of the people. And they want to get the law out, and they want to look at the law. Uh, um, in verse 11, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, and so on in the intervening verses. You know, service for the Lord must be unspotted by sin. It must be unspotted by sin. We need to be clean vessels. And we need to be fit, we need to be fit for the Master's use. use. If you're, serving, if you're serving the Lord with iniquity in your heart, you're wasting your time. We need to be clean. We need to be vessels fit for the Master's use. I was reading this afternoon about Isaiah the prophet. And you know, before, before he was fitted for service, then he had to be cleansed. Uh, you, you can read in your own time. I haven't read, time to read it tonight. Read when you go home Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah there, he got into the presence of the Lord and he realized his sinfulness. And then that, that angelic being came and, and touched his lips and, and he was announced clean. And then the Lord said, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah's hand shut up. Well, maybe he didn't. But he said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll go. He was clean. He was fit. For the master's use. I wonder am I. If there's sin in my life, God can't use me. Work and worship do not sanctify sin, but sin contaminates work and worship. You got it? Work and worship do not sanctify sin, but sin contaminates but sin contaminates work and worship. And if I'm clean, God can use me. That which is unclean defiles that which is holy. That which is unclean defiles that which is holy. I need to get into the presence of the Lord. And I need to be clean, the vessel clean. And then God can take me up and he can use me for his glory. When we come to the last little section, we find there now that his message, his first message appeals to the hands of the people. And the second message appeals to the hearts of the people. And his third message appeals to the holiness of the people. But his last message, well... Uh, it appeals to the hopes of the people. The hopes of the people. And those last verses, verse 20, look. Again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai. Speak unto Zerubbabel. This is, this is, this is a special <coughs> message for this man. What a, what a word it was for Zerubbabel. Look at the Lord saying to him. He's saying, speak to, to Zerubbabel. He, is faithful to, he has been faithful to me. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and the horses and so on. And then in verse 23, the last verse, In that day saith the Lord of hosts, Will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheth Teal, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Isn't that lovely? Saith the Lord of hosts. That little expression occurs 14 times in the verse. Here's a special wee word for this man, Zerubbabel. A special wee word. God's going to fulfill his promises to him. God's enemies will, God's enemies will be judged. God says to Zerubbabel, he says, he says, I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee. Isn't that lovely? Now I want you to look at a verse. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, quickly. Give me two minutes and I'll finish. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. You found it? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now watch. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Not lovely. You know, when I read that this morning, I was sitting in the room by myself, and when I read that this morning, I shouted, Praise the Lord, hallelujah. There was nobody in the house. I'm sure they heard me outside. Isn't it lovely? Oh, God said to Chef Teal, he says, I have chosen thee. God says to us tonight, he says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And lovely. 
What for? Look at the rest. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The Lord of hosts said that. Notice the very last little title of the Lord in the chapter. The Lord of hosts. Fourteen times in the book. It's the Lord Almighty. The focus is on his strength, on his, on his sovereignty. The sovereign God. But listen, brethren and sisters, as I finish tonight, and it's been very scattered because I would have needed another hour, really, to go into it in detail. But listen, the sovereign God, the Lord of hosts, he's not just Haggai's God, and he's not just Zerubbabel's God, and he's not just Joshua's God. Let me read you this verse, and it'll be our final verse tonight. And you can take a note of it, and read it before you go to sleep tonight because if you read it you'll go to sleep and you'll sleep sound as a bell tonight this God is our God forever and ever he will be our guide even unto death and I have a little note in my Bible this God is my God forever and ever he will be my guide even unto death Psalm 48 and verse 14 Brethren and sisters, he's our God. He stands behind his promises. He's forever and ever. He's still in the throne. Don't think as we look out out of this world in this chaotic state, God's not in control. Of course God's in control. He has everything in, in control. It's under his great hands. God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. No trials oppress us. And burdens distress us. He'll never leave us alone. God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. His promise is true. He'll not forget you. God is still on the throne. And so the little book of Haggai closes. I trust that tonight, although our remarks have been very scattered, we'd have needed two hours to really to go into it in a little bit more detail. But I hope it'll give you a wee insight into the prophets and I hope it will whet your appetite to go into these lovely wee minor prophets and look at them and maybe sometime when we'll come back to Valley Sill we'll take a few nights if we get asked, if I get asked back again we'll take a few nights and we'll look at all these wee minor prophets because they're most interesting and there's so many lovely practical lessons in them for you and I as we seek to live our Christian lives and glorify God in them Okay? Thank you for being patient and listening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these lovely wee books that thou hast left us in our Old Testament. Think of Haggai and Amos and Micah and and Zechariah and Zephaniah and these lovely prophets, Lord, and Jonah. And There's so many lovely practical lessons in them, Lord. We thank you for leaving them with us and, and giving them to us. And we pray that thou wouldst help us to delve into them and by the power of thy Holy Spirit to see these lovely lessons that are written in them for us. We thank you for this lovely wee prophecy of Haggai. And we think of these men who are left as an example that we should just look at them and think about them. And we thank you for this lovely title of the Lord Jesus. He's the Lord of hosts. And we bless thee, Father, for our blessed Saviour. We thank thee for our meditations tonight, and we thank thee for those that have come out. And we just pray, Lord, for the assembly here, dash thy blessing upon it. And remember those who aren't well, and need our prayers at this time. We commend them into thy loving hands. And remember our province, Lord. We think of the fear and trepidation that's in people's hearts and Lord, we just come and we just commend it to thee and we pray it that there might be a cessation of, of this terrible virus, Lord. Give, give thy people divine preservation and protection from it as we commit them to thee tonight. So look upon us, Lord, as we leave and be near to us as we commend ourselves to thee and give thanks for the wee cup of tea as well and ask thy blessing on our conversation together in the Lord's precious and in his worthy name. Amen.